So today we're interviewing uh, Cal Gutkin, former uh, CEO and executive director of the college and now retired. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about his uh, introduction to family medicine, his role as CEO, and uh, his perceptions of family medicine. So welcome, Cal. Um, I'd like to start really at the beginning. So um, we've talked to a number of uh, others uh, who've had a role in the college in the past, and I've always started by asking them what drew them to family medicine in the first place, what drew them to certification, just how they, what, why not a specialist, Cal? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a very good question. It was, it's a relevant question now. It was really relevant at the time that I was in medical school and graduated from medical school. Uh, throughout my medical school experience, which I still think of as a, a, a great positive experience at the University of Manitoba, uh, we really had no exposure to general practice or family medicine. Uh, we knew that there were family doctor GPs in the community. Uh, as a matter of fact, many of our families at that time and when we were growing up in town didn't have a family doctor. There was a lot of primary care delivered by specialists. So my sister and I basically had a pediatrician that took care of us up to a certain age. My parents had an internist. Uh, we, uh, I knew several of my friends who had a family doctor, but there weren't, didn't seem to be somebody in our neighborhood who uh, filled that role. And it was not part of the curriculum for me as a, um, and for us as medical students. I uh, basically then after I graduated from medical school, uh, I did um, about six months of practice uh, after a rotating internship in Winnipeg, which was an excellent experience as well. Uh, and I went to Lake of the Woods in Kenora and worked there with the group in Lake of the Woods who were a fabulous group of people and the physicians who were the core part of that group uh, were used to the fact that there would be new graduates coming in who, who had core knowledge and skills but needed help and they helped us a lot uh, but we did have a pretty good uh, base to work from. We had uh, anesthesia skills, some minor surgical and minor uh, intraoperative surgical skills, and a broad base of other skills, but not learned within a context of a discipline, just in terms of doing different rotations. Uh, but these uh, general practitioners were fabulous in terms of what they, uh, they uh, taught us and that they supervised us with, and within a matter of weeks we had picked up other skills. So I, I had a really good experience there, and I had my first real exposure to the general practitioner, and a general practitioner in a uh, rural kind of setting, uh, although there, uh, there were referrals from other small towns and First Nations uh, uh, communities in the area that we both visited and that came in, it was exciting. But I still had not, and I knew I wanted to go back for postgraduate training, and I'd applied at the University of Toronto, and I was accepted into internal medicine, and I did do that. I did two years of internal medicine, and I loved every single experience I had, from one specialty to the next. And, during, and the Department of Family Medicine had uh, been started at the University of Toronto about a year or so, uh, maybe two years, before I actually uh, was doing my internal medicine. And I was at the Toronto Western Hospital where there was a, um, a really excellent dynamic group of family physicians who had started that department, led by Reg Perkin and many others, uh, who I got to know as a medical resident. And as I got into my second year, I was, uh, uh, like my peer residents, I was being asked what subspecialty I would like to go into or uh, carry on in general internal medicine. And I had had a lot of opportunity to interact with this new Department of Family Medicine and the physicians within it and some of the few residents that they had. And actually the, the chief of the department, the head of the Department of, of Medicine, uh, sat down with me and said, you know, uh, you've done well in all of the, the subspecialty areas you've been in. You could pick whatever you want and, and I think you'd be able to be accepted. But it sounds as though you might actually benefit by, because I was talking about an option being I would take a year off and I would just go into practice and I'd see what that would be like because I knew I enjoyed so much the interaction with patients, the people, the patient-doctor relationship and being able to deal with different problems, all ages, all problems that present. And uh, he actually said, I'm going to take you over to the Department of Family Medicine and formally introduce you to them. And maybe they could actually find a role for you even during this year that you would have a look at. And then you can decide which subspecialty you want. 
Well, that was the door opener, and and uh, basically, I uh, I for the next year had a few half days at the family practice unit. I linked up with a community-based practice and uh, and did some uh, days of the week there. And a major thing was that they had no supervising physicians in the emergency department. And according to the chief of medicine, he saw that he thought that I had a a, a natural. Uh, liking for the eMERGE work and he was pleased with what I had done in that area and he said we would like to actually have you act as a senior resident junior staff person supervising in the eMERGE because we don't have a department that takes responsibility for it and I think that was arranged through the Department of Family Medicine that I st started to do that. Well I loved that year and that well, I wasn't going to go I knew I wasn't going to go back after that and I then set up a practice of my own continued at the family practice teaching unit at the Toronto Western for two to three half days a week and uh, we uh, established a department at uh, uh, in the emergency department family medicine more formally took over and I was one of the people who was helping to organize the emergency department from a faculty level and we eventually developed uh, really the one of the first if not the first emergency medicine residency program in family medicine a number of years down the road which I had the privilege of being the director for but the pieces all started to fall together and the joy of being able to have a continuing relationship with patients uh, providing comprehensive care but also having the opportunity to actually uh, also practice and focus for different periods of time during the week on other special interests that I had in emergency medicine being the top one at that time and then I developed an interest in sport medicine and I did that as part of my practice started off fulfilling and remained fulfilling for the rest of my uh, of my career you also asked me about uh, certification so I joined the college and uh, because I felt that uh, it was very important to be part of an organization that was setting the standards, that would help to remind me what the standards should be, would help to direct and motivate me to, to be able to maintain my commitment to keeping up. Uh, maybe I could do it on my own, but I felt the best way to do it is with, a, with an established organization. And I met people through the college, started to get involved through the Ontario chapter on committees and found a great group of people. Uh, and saw certification as important because it gave me the opportunity, although I did not do it as a resident uh, eligible uh, candidate, uh, I wanted to challenge myself to see if as a practice eligible candidate I could meet the standards that had been set. And to me it was a very positive, even fun experience, even though there's always a bit of tension when you're doing exams. And uh, uh, it was most worthwhile and I was very proud of the fact that I was able to attain my certification in family medicine and I didn't think any less of colleagues who were in practice who didn't have it at the time because the majority had been in practice for a long time and were, were uh, as far as I was concerned probably good doctors but I still felt that most uh, of them could benefit if they actually would try this as practice eligible candidates and for the future this would be the direction that family medicine should go and I saw it as not only a part of the medical profession offering services to the community but as a discipline and as a discipline that if if it were going to grow to gain the recognition and respect that it should uh, should have a way of of challenging those who are in the practice to have demonstrated their competencies and be recognized with uh, the symbol of that through certification and have to maintain it. I, I just believed in that and I didn't see it as rigorous and neither did some of my closest colleagues in practice and I knew we were surrounded by many others who thought this was maybe not fair or too rigorous but I thought if we could find a good way through the college uh, even if I was going to help out on some committees or whatever to gradually introduce this in a way that was not that was going to be a a good test and it was going to be valid and relevant that you have this this uh, recognition and, and qualification through certification, uh, it was not going to be uh, just a simple thing to do. On the other hand, it would be something that those who truly practice as family physicians could be proud of and demonstrate to the public that this is what we mean by family medicine, by family practice. So the whole thing was quite positive for me to get involved in this. Great. Um, so you ended up saying, talking about um, uh, this is what family medicine is. Um, so in your mind, um, 
what lies at the core of, of the discipline. I, I, you, you, you came into practice at a time when um, there was a lot of um, uh, uh, thinking and writing going on about family medicine as a discipline, Gail Stevens and Ian McQuinney and so forth, and um, talking about comprehensive continuous care and trying to figure out in their minds or define in their minds what's unique to this discipline um, that makes it, marks it as different. Can, did you, do, can you talk to that at all? And well, I think that like initially I had no knowledge of uh, any of the formal writings or of any of the, uh, the contributions, significant contributions made by people like that you've mentioned, like Gail Stevens and even Ian McWinney. But within a few years, I became very aware, particularly of Ian McWinney. And when I first read some of Ian McWinney's work and his textbook, it seemed to be that not only was I learning from reading it, but it was reinforcing what I thought family medicine should be and the reasons that I went into it. And to me, it was exciting that it actually could be put together in a way that was not only uh, the, the way that, that a family doctor should practice with his or her uh, patient population, but that actually defined a discipline. And that this, you know, I was very concerned about the fact that when I was in medical school, there was, no there was no family medicine department or part of the curriculum. And family medicine and general practice, as it was really being referred to, uh, was really the choice for a career of a small proportion who somehow knew that's what they wanted to be. And I think most of those, I don't, I don't have the, the data for this, but I think most of those in my class who, were, who knew they wanted to be general practitioners came from small towns who actually knew their general practitioner and had that as a role model. Uh, but the majority who ended up in family practice who weren't in that category were people who didn't get accepted into a specialty that they had chosen. And to me, this was not appropriate. This was an incredibly important frontline part of the healthcare system that needed to have a definition of a, as a discipline so that right fr from the start as medical students, you're not thinking of it differently than you'd think of any other specialty. And it should be a specialty. You have to have special skills and knowledge and attitudes to be a family doctor, just as we would expect in any other specialty. But this one's different. Yeah. And it needs to define it. And here it was. It was being defined by Ian McWinney and others. And as I started to read more of that, I started to, and I was starting to mature myself in my career and personally, I saw this as this had to be where the, the future direction of where family medicine and family practice was going to go. Great. Okay. I'm going to, um, I, the other thing I want to touch on a little bit is your, your interest in emergency medicine. And um, I guess how that influences what you think about what family medicine is. And I'll, I'll give you, uh, I'm just going to give you a little anecdote because uh, I, uh, you chaired the Committee on Emergency Medicine, and then Isser, I think, Isser Dubinsky took over after you. And at the time, there was a huge um, debate within the college and at the board about whether emergency medicine was really family medicine, and whether people who did it full-time could use that as practice eligibility for certification in family medicine. Um, because there were a lot of people who went into eMERGE full-time from medical school. Um, and uh, I asked Brian Hannon about it because I remember Brian arguing eloquently that we, there's no way emergency medicine could count as family practice. And when I reminded him of that, he, he said, oh, I don't remember saying that. <laughs> but um, it always, it's, it's one of the things that always struck me. And, and um, I know you have, uh, what, one of the things you really see as important is the skilled clinician uh, as one of the principles of family medicine, as opposed to perhaps some of the others and people. I just wondered if you could talk about that in relation to emergency medicine. Sure. Or, yeah. Well, I never saw uh, my own personal role in the emergency department as something that removed me from family medicine. Uh, as you know, because we worked together through many of those years uh, and, and through my role at the college in the Committee on Emergency Medicine, I was, I don't think I, I'm off base in saying I was always a strong advocate of the family doctor's role in emergency as part of his or her practice. 
and I still believe that today. And the reality that supports that is that in all of the small and smaller communities, that's what happens. And at the time that I became interested in emergency medicine, it was even happening in the larger communities. And I was at a large teaching hospital in downtown Toronto that basically the, the family physicians were the ones who were the physicians in the emergency department. And uh, we had a, uh, an outstanding group there who provided very good service and formed the teaching uh, uh, department for, within the Department of Family Medicine for when the residency training program started. And we were also responsible for uh, supervising and teaching all of the other residents from other disciplines who came through emergency medicine. And, uh, and it was an exciting and, and opportune, <coughs> opportune time for all of us. But I saw it as something that is part of the family physician's commitment to his or her community. The hospital uh, work, and I think all of the in-hospital work, including emergency department work, is something that does uh, provide benefit for the family physician to maintain, maintain his or her skills and even augment his or her skills that are carried over into practice, both through the kinds of of uh, clinical situations you're encountering, your interaction with uh, other specialists who get involved in some of the acute care situations, and the need to continue to keep up in some of these that, that I think are only positive. And I always found that personally, if I was seeing a patient in the office who had a cardiac problem or a diabetic problem that uh, was, was something on the verge of becoming something I saw in the emergency department or was presenting in the same way, I knew how to deal with it there. And it gave me great confidence in terms of what I could actually uh, provide for my patient in terms of things I did at that moment or the advice I had to give them and direct them to what they needed. And I, I think that the, uh, the loss of that for family physicians, the in-hospital role and the emergency department role is, is, I think, an unfortunate thing. I would still like to see that come back as gradually as it, it may happen in certain settings that that would be beneficial. I saw emergency as, uh, I don't think emergency medicine is the same as family medicine. It has a lot of the skills that you need are similar and maybe even the same, a lot of. But it's a different context and, and when, I'd always refer through the rest of my career and particularly when I became CEO of the college because I'd get a lot of calls from people who knew me saying I need a family doctor and I'd refer them to the source that would give them names of family doctors who are in their community. And I'd get a call back saying, well, I called that doctor and uh, he said uh, he's an emergency physician. I need, a, I need somebody who's going to take care of all my problems for me and my family. And I realized it's not the same thing, even though the, the, the discipline of family medicine is, is actually very relevant to becoming a good emergency physician. And I think emergency physicians, even those who do it full time, and we have many in our college, benefit themselves and their patients benefit by them having had a, a, a basis in training in, and coming from family medicine and staying committed to family medicine and what family medicine stands for. Mm -hmm. But they need to also uh, maintain skills in an area, if that's all they're doing, that is appropriate to that context. And I think, I think emergency medicine now that it's delivered by a uh, cadre that includes those who now have the opportunity to do Royal College full-time emergentology training and, and practice in that way, mixed with people who've done our training and got a certificate of special competence in emergency medicine. I think they can all provide excellent care. I would still prefer to see most people who do it through family medicine combine it with their practices and I strongly believe that the hospitals and the healthcare system should actually go so far as to making that a requirement and they should be required to have some of those people on the staff of their hospital. People who are linked to a community-based practice and understand all of that, not just those who are doing full-time. But I do believe we can accommodate and support as a college those of our colleagues who have decided personally to make it full-time but come from a family medicine background. We have a lot to offer them. We gave them a strong base through their family medicine training. They are, they are good doctors, they're benefiting their patients, they, many of them remain committed to the, to the principles of family medicine. But for the future, I think we should be telling medical students and those in training that they have a choice to make. That basically if they want to do just full-time emergency medicine, they should really think seriously about the Royal College program and become emergentologists. But if they want to include emergency medicine 
as part of what they do as family doctors, which I really think is worthwhile. Do it through our programs, either through your core family medicine, after which many people are capable of going out and doing emergency medicine, or taking the additional training to get a certificate of special competence, but include it as part of a broader base of practice and contribute as a family physician should to the broader context of care for patients. Okay. Um, so let's talk about that in the, in the broader context of, of all the clinical areas that family docs might get involved in as, uh, if for a special interest or even focused practice. Um, so I'll give you some back context for that. Um, I have a, a friend who's a family doc who is now full-time palliative care. And when I asked him about why, he just said, well, I like it. And a lot of my colleagues don't want to do it. And they started referring patients. And pretty soon, that was all I was doing. Um, and then I had a conversation with Phil Berger, um, who talked about the HIV, rise of HIV, and who in the city dealt with it before anybody really knew what they were dealing with. And he said it was all family docs. Um, and yet I now see a kind of movement towards specialists becoming, it's like HIV is an infectious disease uh, area that only uh, infectious disease specialists should deal with. And, and we've got palliative care coming on as a specialty. And yet within the college, you championed um, uh, supporting our members who, who took on these areas of special interest. Can you talk a bit about how, how sure. you see that balance? And so there, there is a significant menu of areas of special interest and you're aware of that and you've given a couple of examples that are very important ones because, and they're all different, they differ. There are areas of special interest for family physicians where there is very little debate about the fact that this belongs in the purview of a family physician and in, in the, as part of the, the care they provide. And actually very few family doctors who have special interest in, the, in some of these areas are doing it full time, uh, but they are doing it for more of their time than maybe some others do. And we do need leaders within family medicine who help the rest of the family doctors to be able to actually maintain their competencies and have as a kind of mini referral colleague uh, before the need for a Royal College full-time specialist actually is needed. Mm -hmm. And there are some of these areas that don't have Royal College specialties and many that do. This should not be a competition with the Royal College and there's no need for that. There's lots of work out there and challenge for everyone. And most of those, even uh, my colleagues who do full-time in areas like palliative care or, or uh, in, in sport medicine or in any of the, the vast number of, of areas, they still refer to Royal College specialists who, where there is a Royal College specialty there because they reach a point where they need to have that more complex case, which should be what the Royal College specialists are there for. But they, they provide that buffer in our system where access to care is such a problem and we need to do more and do more at a, at a higher quality level as a team of family physicians providing this. And I think even in uh, the patient's medical home types of models that exist with team-based care that family physicians with uh, comprehensive continuing care practices and no real focus within their practice because they, they spend all their time on, on anybody who comes in should work together with some of their colleagues who have more focused practices and special interests and provide better access to care before there's a need to send on to a specialist but that will still happen. So I see in all of these areas, I see a very relevant role in palliative care is an area that the reality is across Canada, the majority of the care provided for patients in pal for palliative care uh, is provided by family doctors. And it's going to be for, I don't know how long into the distant future you can see. So we have to do something about being sure that at the core family medicine postgraduate training level, we are doing the, the job we should in preparing our graduates for having the competencies to be able to provide a lot of that care. And that goes for a lot of these other areas of special interest as well. Then there will be a subpopulation of those family physicians, either coming through residency or some who are already in practice, who we could offer something to where they could actually enhance their skills. And we could give a recognition of that. But they should not think that they have become Royal College specialists through this, they're not. The Royal College has a longer program that involves other goals and objectives within it than we have as family doctors. 
and the majority of them, whether they do just they do the core family medicine or they do the core plus a bit more, I would hope that they would see the opportunity to do this as part of a broader base practice. Even if they do more palliative care or do more of X, Y, Z than some of their colleagues, they work together as teams, they help one another out with their patients when they, uh, they need the care in an area that a family physician with special interest has some extra skills that the other family physician doesn't. And perhaps that other family physician has extra skills in, in dealing with children with asthma that the, that the family physician who does more palliative care doesn't. And they could benefit the patient and patient population at the center. And my belief is down the road this will have minimal impact on the need for Royal College specialists in all of these other disciplines. We'll still need them, but these, the people will be getting better care up front. And as a college, we should be supporting this and defining, we should be defining what we mean by special interests in family medicine and not leaving it to the community at large, the community of our family physicians who are not trying to do anything evil, they're trying to do something good, but they've had no context within which they make their decisions about how they should incorporate special interests into their practice. They have no idea of what they should really do to attain the competencies that would make them good at doing that, even if they do it as part of a broader base practice. That's what our college's role should be. But we should not be deceiving anyone into making it seem as though our main objective is to be training many specialists or subspecialists. They should be family doctors. All right, great. Um, I think I want to just switch gears now, um, and and because uh, because at a certain point in your career, somebody came and asked you if you'd think about being the executive director of the College of Family Physicians. Um, so I'd like to get you to talk a bit about um, once you said, "Oh, all right." Um, <laughs> what what were you hoping to achieve by by taking that role on? Um, I I looked at Victor Johnson, who who basically saw the need to save general practice, um, and and what he saw as necessary for that was to build a a strong academic community, um, and and Don Rice, I think, charged into this because he. It had gotten to the point where we need it needed to be done. Like we needed to have standards and we needed to have certification, and he took that on as his chance. What he was going to realize, um, and I think um, when and and Reg, I think carried that forward a bit uh, in his own career and started building bridges to other organizations and all. But I, what did you? I think you changed gears a bit from because I think the organization perhaps had matured to a point where it, there needed to be a new agenda. Do, can you, maybe I'm wrong, but do you want to talk about no, that? No, you're not wrong at all. And, and I, I think that, uh, and I had uh, referred earlier in our discussion to the work that was being done by the college, and it was being led by initially Victor Johnson and the members who were elected to leadership positions at that time, and then Don Rice, who was the executive director at the time I first became involved with the college. and. Uh, was involved on some national committees, got involved through the Ontario chapter, the Ontario College of Family Physicians as it's now called, and was their president, and sat on the national board. And I continued to be uh, both impressed and motivated by the work that had been done in establishing family medicine as, uh, well, first of all, saving family medicine, because there's no doubt, and I referred to that even when I was in medical school, it was, uh, it was certainly not looking positive for the future for general practice or family medicine, and, and no uh, inkling of it becoming a, a discipline that would be respected within the academic community. My belief was and, and remained through my career and still today that establishing and strengthening family medicine as an academic discipline was important not only within the academic community, but was important for saving family and general practice uh, in the in communities at large of practice, in the practice communities. Because there would be no future people to go to any communities if the medical students everywhere were not seeing this as a credible kind of choice for a career. Uh, so it had to be built as a discipline. An incredible work was done by those who uh, led the college, uh, Victor Johnson, Don Rice, and Reg Perkin in this college before me, that 
that uh, was kind of intimidating for me to think about actually stepping in and following in their footsteps. And Reg, who I'd worked with at University of Toronto as well, was, I mean, I, I to this day revere the kind of work that he did and uh, respect it. And, and I wasn't coming in to try to, uh, to take apart or undo any of what was done. What I saw was we'd reached another point in time where we had to leap forward to the next level. And I think Reg had, in, in the continuum that he, he was part of, had set the stage for that through things you've mentioned in terms of, okay, starting to build stronger relationships with other organizations and a visibility within the healthcare system, and I thought this was critically important. Uh, my colleagues and I in practice were seeing the college, and I was getting feedback through my work in the Ontario chapter uh, from members across Ontario for sure who there was a group that was dedicated to the college and another group who had no use for the college and some in the middle who kind of belonged but didn't seem to really understand what the role of the college was but saw it as an academic group and they were in because they had certification they were afraid to, to not be members they didn't want to lose their certification and maybe their privileges where they were or whatever it meant to them which was important but they weren't really seeing much broader than that I thought it was time to broaden this it was time to have a better understanding amongst the thousands of family doctors from coast to coast to coast about the value of having a an organi professional organization that would be their home that they would see it as their home and they would see themselves as part of both the practice community and the discipline. But they didn't have to feel that they had to make a commitment that was going to be to what they would describe as an ivory tower uh, in terms of, of being able to uh, attain this. That we had to reach out and, and demonstrate to family doctors across the country that their role is invaluable as not only clinicians who are providing service to their patients, clinical service, but as teachers and as researchers and as part of what we all strive to be, which is uh, an organization uh, supporting family doctors and family medicine so that it will exist forever for the benefit of the public. So uh, not everyone who's going to teach, not everyone who's going to do research has to be doing this with a full-time commitment or a commitment to the point of, of, of seeing that they're now wed to uh, what would be seen as an academic environment, the traditional academic environment. And again, I heard time and time again that we're a discipline. We've got, we're now into the tertiary care hospitals and into the university centers that are linked to them, but we really don't understand what's going on in the communities at large. I was hoping that with the team that I would work with, we would be able to bring all family physicians together. And we'd have to have strategies to do that in different areas within academic family medicine and by continuing to, to build and strengthen academic family medicine, teaching, research, lifelong learning. That would never change to, in my mind. That had to become stronger and stronger and, and serve as the model that everyone would aspire to be, to be joined together with. But with more of a welcoming kind of approach to the broader base of family physicians who weren't going to be part of that core environment. It's actually been intriguing to see what's happened over the, the decade plus, two decades really since then, because at that time there was no talk about distributed learning. There was no talk about satellites. Uh, there was, I had a personal experience where I went from a downtown hospital to a community hospital and it, the, the, uh, it was contentious as to whether I would be able to maintain my appointment within the Department of Family Medicine, whether I could still be the director of the emergency residency program, whether I could still be part of the Department of Family Medicine. Well, you know, I'd hear from the, the uh, academic department, who were great people, I, 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 I love being part of that group, that they'd have to think about this because I was going out to a community hospital. Well, today that is no longer the case. The community hospitals and, and, and uh, physici family physicians in all sorts of small, very small communities even, are a critically important part of offering training to those who are becoming physicians of the future. But that wasn't always the case, and that was something that I felt when I started in 1995-96, 96 when I assumed the role from, from Reg in, fe in March 1st of that year, that would be one of my goals, would be over the next several years to build this and to respond as well to a voice that was coming to me that, that got stronger over the next decade from both within Canada as well as through my experience internationally through Wonka that 
where I was being asked all the time, why is it that family medicine is not a specialty in Canada? And medical students asking me this question. Medical students at a time in the, in the uh, between year 2000 and 2004, where we were losing uh, the popularity that family medicine had as a first choice for medical students, which had been really superb in the late 80s and, and early 90s, it was falling off. And one of the things that kept coming up was students saying, they're going through school, yeah, family medicine's there, but why isn't it a specialty? Mm -hmm. And so we'd sit and talk about it. Well, what do you think a specialty is? And, what do you, and, and they weren't seeing it as something that, uh, that took away the essence of being a generalist. They saw it as being the experts in that area. Students taught me that. And the other group were people from other countries that, where Canada plays a very significant role, and Don Rice and Reg Perkin led the way here, and that's at Wonka, the world organization, where in other nations, family medicine had become a specialty. And they say, you know what, in Canada, you've got one of these, the, the gold standards for your academic family medicine. We try to follow a lot of what you're doing in Canada. Why aren't you a specialty? <laughs> And so I'd ask them what they did, because they also had to overcome hurdles with this. And some of them have, have written and published articles on this that we all uh, studied when we were looking at this issue again. But I felt that it was an important thing for that whole uh, strengthening of the respect and credibility of family medicine as not only part of the academic community, but as part of the community at large. I mean, I have no problem with, with patients in the patient population who, uh, to explain to them that family medicine is a specialty and see a very positive response. I saw that in neighbors and friends and relatives who would say, well, we think we should you know, only be seeing a specialist. And say, well, family medicine is now a specialty. Well, really, tell me about that. Well, it's a specialty because it has its own uh, defined core of knowledge, skills, and attitudes that you must learn and maintain through your career. And you have to, be, you have to demonstrate those to, to gain a certification in this specialty. And you have to maintain that when you're in practice to maintain that certification. And it does mean something in terms of, of aspiring towards something like that, the same as every other specialty. Oh, well that's really impressive. That's very important to me and my family to know that. So I thought that was important. Yeah, yeah. It, one of the unusual aspects of, of I think Canadian medicine is that there's this Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons that got set up in 1929 to recognize all the all the specialty areas that were coming along, um, and and yet the, this family medicine is a separate college, um, and I'm often asked, was often asked, why, um, and um, I just wondered if you could talk about what, uh, well, do you feel that we do need our own college as a discipline of family medicine and um, what uh, makes that uh, a good thing, I suppose? Um, yes, I do. I think it was a wise decision by uh, those involved in making the decision at the time and all of us who've read the history know about the tensions that existed and, uh, you know, the, the debates involving the Royal College who'd been formed 25 years before we became officially a college in 1954. The Royal College was established in 1929. The CMA, who had the authority to basically uh, make the decision to approve the formation of these colleges. And, and without going into all the pros and cons, it was a fairly heated debate. But, but I think it was a wise decision because I think family medicine uh, is quite different from the other specialties. I think the other specialties have more in common with one another. Uh, half the doctors in Canada belong to the other specialties and half of them are general practitioners and family doctors. And the family physicians represent in a very healthy way in, in our system, and I think systems that are like Canada's system, this is one of the great strengths, they are the front line of the medical, the entry into the medical care part of the system. And I think that if, if a system supports that properly, that's a very important thing. But it's quite different than the other specialties. We should not be at the same level where people could come in at any one of those levels and we're seeing ourselves as all the same. Uh, the importance of being different, as Ian McWinney wrote about, applies not only to the difference in the clinical practice, 
Uh, it applies to the differences in teaching and in the context of that teaching and the differences in research that has to be carried out and where the support should go and if it all gets mixed together with those who see themselves as part of the same organization there's a, an excellent chance that that could be lost, that importance of being different. Patients benefit by having family physicians who help them uh, and advocate for them for that very difficult journey through the healthcare system. And the fact that we, we are recognized as the, as the specialty that you go to for all of your care and that can and should then be working with you as the patient to help to direct you to all of the other specialties when needed is critical. If we are all the same and we became part of the same club, if you will, I have a great concern that we would not be seeing ourselves as that unique and different discipline that we really are. I do believe that the relationship between the College of Family Physicians and the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons is critically important and that a very positive and strong relationship should exist with very honest sharing of our tensions and concerns. I've always believed there's compromise that can be found in, in any of these kinds of tensions and that we should respect one another as different in many areas and yet having the same objective of trying to serve the public at the center. Uh, I, I, I think that in terms of the voice representing family doctors and the patients they serve, which is not just a, a select subgroup who see us because they have a problem with a particular part of their bodies, mm -hmm. that one organ isn't working. This is the total person. We need our own voice. We need our voice that is represented to other organizations within the system. We need our voice to the public, very importantly. We need our voice to government that is different than the voice of the Royal College. Many times we should be there together, voicing concerns for all. But we need to voice that concern as an independent body that represents the whole patient. And I think that the way to do it is with an organization that is, is functioning and organized and its infrastructure is separate, yet builds strong bonds with Royal College, with Canadian Medical Association, with the other health, major health care and medical associations. You, you took on the, the title of uh, Chief Executive Officer, which was different from everybody else, and you maintained the Executive Director role. I'd like to, you know, to talk a little bit about what you saw, uh, what you see as the role of a CEO, and maybe wrap that into what you uh, would like to see as your legacy uh, following your retirement. Well, I think uh, when I assumed the role, uh, I knew that a very strong foundation had been built. And I think uh, with the leadership of Victor Johnson and Don Rice and Reg Perkin, the time was right to uh, be able to move forward even further, thanks to the work that had been done. Uh, key to being able to do that was to continue with the strong core of the team that had been built, both at the staff level and the, and the member level, and to have a vision for how we could continue to build that. Uh, I thought there was great opportunity to uh, further augment our membership because there were so many who still did not belong to the college. Uh, there was a great opportunity to continue to build on, in particular, the strengths that had been developed within the academic family medicine environment by uh, augmenting our organizational relationship with all of the uh, other key stakeholders in academic family medicine and a very important uh, vista that had just begun to be explored by the college and that was in the role of being a political voice and advocate more publicly on behalf of the college. When I started the college had just, come, had just released a green paper uh, as a response to uh, what was called the Bear Stoddard Report at the time, which had to do with uh, physician resources and training positions. And there, was a, there were many contentious issues at the time, but the college had actually stepped forward and taken a much more public position at that time. And as soon as I started, actually, and assumed the role from uh, Reg Perkin, I was getting uh, letters at the time from, uh, mostly from, and it wasn't an, uh, an enormous amount, but I'd have uh, half a dozen or more letters from long-standing members that thought we should not be doing this. Uh, those who thought we should do it, as is often the case, weren't sending letters, so you hear more from those who see it. And I respected their concern. They did not see the college as a body that should be getting into this, and yet the college board had made a decision that 
that it did want us to start getting into it. So we spent some of the initial time that, that, uh, that uh, when I became the executive director and CEO, uh, exploring at a member committee level, board level, staff level, uh, the pros and cons of where we were going. Uh, and it was a clear majority that felt that we had to be a stronger and more independent voice for the, expressing the needs of family physicians and the patients that family physicians serve, which again I think reinforced the value of us being a, an independent organization that could do this. Uh, so that was certainly something that I was very interested in in terms of bringing all of our communities together. We developed a very important strategy with regard to our annual meeting, which uh, I found to be something that became a priority for me because I did not think that the work and effort that we were putting into it at that time was uh, getting the kind of reward at the end that it deserved in terms of, it was always an excellent meeting but the attendance was around 500, 550 people in an organization with uh, 10 to 12,000 members uh, and it was really each year that I would go I would see it was almost the same people in terms of the core who were already very involved in the college and that's fine it was a great meeting for them and everybody learned but if we were going to reach out to the the masses out there who were they where were they did they know us did they recognize us did they see us as a group that that were not welcoming to them uh, and so we did some surveys of, of some of this we had a very strong and still in its earlier phases section of teachers which, which definitely had to be maintained as a strong core of our college, a new and, and uh, potentially strong section of researchers. They were holding their own separate meeting at that time and we had debates about whether we could bring these communities together by not symbolically suggesting we have one meeting for this group, one meeting for another, that we're all town and gown and we're not, we're not really bringing everybody together as a community of family physicians. So we got approval to start what we then called Family Medicine Forum, which began in the year 2000. We doubled the attendance the first year to 1,000. We brought the section of teachers meeting and, and our researchers together with, with the clinical practice meeting, and it continued to grow from that point in time. I think in 2012, when, when I, my last year here in Toronto, we had something like 5,500 people or whatever at the meeting. Numbers are not the important thing. The meeting, the feedback we get about how dynamic this was and how people would leave feeling they understood they were part of a large and meaningful, relevant community. Uh, you tend to feel very isolated in your practice every day, uh, even if you're in a big city. You just go to work and you do your thing and you face the problems you're facing. You think you're the only one that has these kinds of challenges on your plate. By, by getting together with and seeing that this is a large, dynamic, uh, relevant community and issues that can be shared and talked out both in terms of challenges in clinical practice and, and quality of care as well as some of the things that are happening on the medical political side that family doctors need support for. So Family Medicine Forum became very important as a way of bringing the communities together. And I think it started to, because we would, we would have, we notice in our attendees, we would always have a proportion that uh, was a smaller proportion but not insignificant of non-members. And we would start to see that some of those people would actually join the college. And so it was significant as well. It was just one thing, but it, it was and I think still is a very important uh, uh, program that the college, that the college uh, basically is responsible for in terms of being seen as the organization that is there for all the family physicians in the country and having them have a chance to see that that actually is happening, that they are there with hundreds of others of their colleagues, meeting new people, meeting old friends, talking over things, I think it's critical. So we had an opportunity at that time when I, when I started in this role to actually uh, explore different strategies that would help us to become that more meaningful organization. Strategies that would build on what had been started as an independent, strong voice. Uh, when, uh, when I first started, we would find that if we were trying to get heard and, and uh, arrange uh, visits that would be appropriate with, with government leaders at the federal level in Ottawa, and the National College is responsible for the, the federal uh, and uh, relationships with our college, while the chapters basically assume the lead role at the provincial territorial levels, uh, we were often meeting with response like, we well, have to remind us who you are. So although inroads had been made and we did find players who definitely knew who we were, there were still too many that didn't in other organizations and at key government levels. 
And so we had strategies put in place to start to, to address that in terms of meeting the bureaucrats, in terms of putting out papers and making sure they got them and following up uh, so that we could discuss them with them. We, it didn't always have to be in a face-to-face -face meeting. Of, of uh, broadening the base of, of uh, our membership who actually would become involved in this and could actually advocate with people who were in key stakeholder positions uh, and had relationships within that part of the country with people who were our members. So lots of things that we're doing this. We were very concerned about the fall off in student choice of family medicine, which, uh, which really became a reality, not in my f so much in my first few years, but uh, started probably within three or four years later than that and continued uh, right through into the first to half of the uh, decade from 2000 to 2005 or 6. Uh, there was a problem with physician resources in Canada and, and uh, we were part of the Canadian Medical Forum which is the leaders of nine or ten national medical organizations who made this physician resource challenge one of its priority issues and we had, uh, we, we co-chaired that. This was another sign that we were being recognized as equal in many ways to the CMA and the Royal College in particular and several committees were set up with co-chairs from those three organizations. Previously we might not have achieved that. And one of the big ones was how to address the physician resource sh shortage. And, and the area it was hitting the hardest was family medicine. And at the same time as it was hitting family medicine the hardest, it proved to be a deterrent to medical students to selecting family medicine as a career. Because they were all they were hearing and reading about was we don't have enough family doctors, the ones who are left are so overwhelmed because they're trying to handle patients in their practice and, and uh, being, it's being suggested they should continue to take on more and more patients even though they can't handle the load they have because there is no one else to do this. Uh, this was not a healthy thing. So we had to address the physician resource issue and we had to address the medical student issue in terms of reasons and we again surveyed medical students, met with medical students and there was a list of reasons why they were not seeing family medicine any longer as their, as their uh, number one choice. We hit a low of around 23 to 24 percent, choosing it as first choice in 2003-2004, and we certainly hoped we were going to bottom out there. So we built a few things. We decided that medical students should have a greater role within our organization. We established a section of medical students, which we'd never had before. We had medical students' uh, positions added to our board. We went around to medical schools across the country with the help of our chapter representatives and people in the academic departments and we started to play a more active role. We uh, established medical student, uh, family medicine interest groups amongst the medical students in every school. We got some funding support both from the college and helped advocate for some government support in some provinces and had medical students running these groups and had family doctors in their communities meeting with medical students in the evenings and on weekends and showing them some of the things that happen in family practice, doing simple procedures that they do in their offices. Student feedback was incredible. They never knew family doctors did this stuff. They were learning that, you know, taking care of diabetics, taking care of people with congestive heart failure in their lectures and seminars and small groups, it was, it was always other specialists that, they, that were the, the people who were identified as caring for those people. 85 to 90 percent of the population with these problems are cared for by family doctors without specialist referral. It's, it's a smaller percentage and we know this from all of the studies of the demography of, 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 uh, of medical care and health care in North America. That this is the case. The studies by Kerr White in the 50s and by Larry Green more recently. So we built on that and, and built a medical student presence and came back such that uh, more recently we're back up to around 34, 35 percent of students selecting family medicine first. So these were amongst the goals starting out that take time and then there was the whole issue of needing to address the changing reality in practice. Yes, we will never have uh, enough family doctors to take care of everybody in, the, in all of our communities alone. Everyone we believe should have a family doctor. The work by Starfield and Machinko and, and all their colleagues showing the value to uh, population health outcomes of having a family physician is clear that population health outcomes are definitely better in populations that have access to a personal family physician. Uh, but family physicians can't care for the whole spectrum of every problem only on their own in the most e efficient or effective way. 
Uh, we respect our colleagues who still try to do that and in some small communities for sure that may be the only thing that realistically can happen. But where it's possible team-based care is where we're at and so our college again through some debate uh, that took place at committees and board levels has reached the point I hope of, of, a, of a dedicated uh, commitment and maturity in recognizing the value of a team-based approach with family physicians still playing a key role with every person uh, having a personal family physician but not necessarily needing to see just that family physician for every problem. There can be nurses, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, physio and occupational therapists, clin uh, therapists clinical pharmacists, many others who can play a role on teams quite appropriately within a setting. Family doctors and colleague family physicians who have special interests. Family physicians and our Royal College specialty colleagues together in a patient's medical home as we, we are calling it in terms of our vision of what a practice could look like. And with the goals of that being measured by quality outcomes that we want to measure and follow. That's the future. And that's a future for the public of Canada and a future for family medicine and family physicians. And those that are getting into those kinds of practices, it's still early, but the feedback is very positive from the family physicians, from other healthcare professionals, and very importantly from patients who are part of practices like that. So these are all things that were early visions at the start of my time. We had a team that we put together of leaders, staff, uh, members who were elected to positions, sat on committees, who shared these visions and did the nitty-gritty work that had to be done to be able to achieve those things and many more that I'm not you know referring to but those were some of the key things that happened during that 16 to 17 years. Uh, do you have some thoughts about the role of a chief executive officer within an organization, particularly this organization? What's the and you've talked about your vision and, and then I look back, I've seen, looked at the vision of previous executive directors, but um, is there, a, can you talk more generally about the role of the CEO, um, particularly for those who may come down the road? <laughs> well, the expected role of the CEO as it was described to me before I was selected for the position was that in this organization it was expected that the CEO along with the elected leadership primarily through the office of the president would be uh, key spokespersons for this organization so it wasn't intended to just be an administrative role in the back in the background and in all honesty I don't know if I would have been attracted to it if it had been that uh, and I saw the my predecessors uh, particularly the ones I knew personally, Don Rice and Reg Perkin, as fulfilling exactly that. I saw them as people who we counted on as members when I was out there in practice in my community and I was doing some teaching, etc. I saw Reg Perkin and Don Rice and the elected presidents, but Reg and Don were there more often. They continued over longer periods of time as the voice for us. So I was not averse to being that. On the other hand, it doesn't mean it's the only voice or that all the decisions are made by that, that individual, and I hoped it was not going to be that. You have to have a team. And it was very important to have that team, and I think the role of a CEO is to ensure that you've got the strongest possible people at particularly the leadership levels on staff, the director level. We had a superb uh, senior staff over the years. A few people changed from time to time, but a great team. And the elected volunteer members were outstanding. I mean they along with the senior staff to my mind were the leadership of this organization during my time and you know you have healthy debates about a lot of issues that's okay you need that you need to be challenged not everything you put on the table is is right my style of leadership is and what I know I enjoy and that I learned through leadership positions I had uh, were the things where where I should be putting maybe some of my own priorities for my role are at the creative level, the uh, attempt to motivate and, and maybe inspire, uh, and I'm okay at the detail and I'm not averse to it, but I need strong people in those areas. So as a leader, you have to identify and be honest about where your own interests and, and strengths are and where you need help. And each leader can, can do an equally uh, excellent job meeting what the organization expects if he or she recognizes that. 
So whoever preceded me would have different strengths than I would, and whoever follows me would have different strengths than people in other organizations would. But we need other people to then fill in for whatever is, is, uh, is not a personal strength. I think you have to be able to, to relate. I think just as, as the patient-doctor relationship is key to family medicine, the relationships between the CEO executive director of our college and the relationships within the organization, with our members and staff, etc., but critically in terms of with all of the other stakeholders is important. I'm a strong believer in relationship building between the CEO that I was and the CEOs of other organizations and to find every opportunity that, that I could as a CEO or leader to meet one-on-one -on -one with those people, sit down where we're not surrounded by errors and be honest with one another about the issues that are actually on the table and the problems that we're having, the challenges, the way we're perceiving their reaction and I want to know how they're perceiving us and how can we as leaders understanding one another better do what we should to find the compromise that's going to make it work for all of us because I do believe that for all of the differences that we had to face with some of our other organizations we all had an in common goal and I think we were being honest about it. We want to do what's best for our own members. We have to serve them. But we all shared the goal of trying to do what was best for the people of this country in terms of their health care. And sometimes we had to hammer it out because we, had, we were coming from some other turf interest areas. And there, to my, my way of thinking, there's always a compromise solution. And I think it's a big part of leadership to be able to find that. Uh, so those, those are some of the things in leadership in terms of providing motivation and, and uh, inspiration, but doing some of the roll up your sleeves kind of work that involves the relationship building so people understand one another. Most, uh, most differences in my experience occur because there is not actually a full understanding of one another. And uh, how often it had been that, that I was surprised when I would explain some of the details about how we got to a certain position that the people I was meeting with said, well, I never knew, I never knew that, and that's starting to make more sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're not bad people, and they're not bad people. But we end up in conflicts, and this, the whole system pays a price for this in terms of not being able to come to some uh, reasonable compromise positions with things. I think what we're doing now in terms of team building in, in care uh, models at the primary care level, but even in the whole system level, is a, is a real example of this. We still have our interorganizational conflicts. We all know we're trying to get to the same point. We get too dug in with some of the things that are, that are basically uh, only in the best interests of our own people. We th at least some of them think that. And in the end, we can usually often achieve some of those objectives that even our opponents within our own organizations think if we work together better. In the patient's best interest, and I believe in the best interest for the health and well-being of our own physicians, we need to be looking at team-based care with the appropriate and well-understood significant role of physicians, and in particular family physicians in the primary care, uh, delivery of primary care and teaching it and doing research in it. Okay, great. Um, so finally, let's look ahead. Um, the, uh, my experience of the college has been as a group of uh, practitioners and who were beating down the doors of the establishment to be recognized as a significant player in education and in practice and so forth. And my sense of it is that between Reg and yourself, the college is now perhaps part of the establishment. And the membership's growing probably to the point where it represents the big majority of family docs in the country. Um, how do you, if, if you're not uh, energized by trying to establish yourself a, as, an or, as, a, as a profession and an organization, how do you keep from becoming kind of moribund and, and begin to become irrelevant? Uh, how do you keep that energy going, I guess? And what, are the, what do you see coming down the road? Right. <laughs> well, I think that um I don't think there's that much danger of us becoming uh, moribund or, or falling asleep at the switch. The challenges are always there. They change, which is part of it. As a matter of fact, even when we were talking about the role of a CEO, I think another one is, and it ties into this, is 
that you have to be open to change and you also have to be constantly monitoring the effectiveness of things you're doing uh, to understand that you may have thought when you put something in place that was going to be the best approach but you have to learn as you go along and make the changes that will make it the best approach because it isn't always going to work that way. So there's always change because we live in a changing society. When Again, when I first started, one of the major projects we had was the Janus Project, and that was how family physicians can meet the changing needs of our society. And that actually became a very significant thing in, in helping to, to focus our college and actually focus our foundation, which was in its early years, the Research and Education Foundation, with projects we were supporting that were looking at how we are doing things and how physicians out there are doing things that are actually responding to change. And change is always happening. It's always happening. We talked a few minutes ago about the team-based model. That's a change. I mean, I can tell you that a decade to 12 years ago, when we talked to our members or surveyed them, the majority were opposed to us getting into this. They saw this as something that was just going to allow others to take over our role. We still have that concern. Many still have that concern. Much of it has gone away because there's a reality of how we adapt to that change that can make it work for everyone. So I think that change is one of the things, without even defining what those changes are, that uh, will keep an organization like this always alive and vibrant. And those changes occur at the practice level and therefore the political and advocacy level, and very critically at the level of academic family medicine in terms of what's happening and how we teach and how we train. What do we do at the undergraduate level for our contribution? How do we uh, approach our, our residency training programs? I mean, during my time, another major thing was a major change in curriculum with the introduction of the Triple C uh, curriculum and the, the importance of, of, of the focus on the context of family medicine as we're training people while still not losing the, the ability to make sure that our residents have the competencies. And at the same time as we've emphasized that need for more focus on the context of family medicine, the people who have led the way for this new curriculum have emphasized the importance on focusing on competencies. And in many cases, more clearly defined competencies that we actually will have to be measuring and, and, uh, and uh, the individuals who are training have to demonstrate. Uh, that they have those competencies and that will affect curriculum and that changes. It changes depending on what the needs of the population are. I mean we, we should be training people who are then going to fit appropriately to meet the changing needs of our society. Uh, there are changes in, in uh, the realities of, of uh, a curriculum for anyone who's training to be a physician that have to be addressed uh, in family medicine and some of these are areas that there was an initial assumption that because this is sounding like it's higher tech or more advanced that family doctors won't play a significant role. Classic case being what's happening in the area of genetics and genomics. This is an area that has incredible challenges that are going to be there not just for the physicians providing the care but mostly for our population. The ethical challenges, the decision making that's going to have to be made about what the pros and cons are of actually having some of this information. Family doctors should be really well versed in this and should be playing a lead role, not a secondary role. The family doctor and, and the team that provide the continuity of care, the comprehensive continuing care are, and it's been shown time and again, that's who patients trust the most. That's who patients should be turning to for these things that are now coming and that are on the leading edge for the future. Not just going to an office where there's another specialist who will play a significant role in helping to, to answer questions and help to direct, but that's not the person who knows this family or this individual the best. That's the role for the family doctor. So we have to be sure that our curriculum actually is going to include that, that our continuing professional development and CME is going to include that, and that we're aware that this is an area where we want to assume a lead role. And it's not the only one. The whole area of public health, where family doctors have often felt that they are left on the outside edges of what's going on in public health, and things happen in public health offices that affect the whole population. What role does the family doctor play when outbreaks of HIV or flu epidemics occur? Family doctors are needed as, as a core for this. They're never sure what their role should be. We should be part, a core part of that public health system. And we should be training our people so that they know everything that they should about immunizations and about what actions have to be taken in various situations with outbreaks of various illnesses. We have to be playing that lead role in chronic disease management, which is being defined as part of the public health system. It ties back into the patient's medical home. 
in terms of providing that care for all people, but if you actually have to define a population that I believe the patient's medical home or the group practice models should be focusing on who are at the highest need, it's patients with chronic disease. That should be a priority. And if over the next decade or more, we could actually provide care for everyone, but actually show and do the research and show quality, continuous quality improvement in terms of how we are taking care of people with chronic diseases, how we are preventing hospitalizations, how we are preventing complications, that would be a huge success. And we have a much better chance of doing that through a patient's medical home model than a traditional kind of scattered model where everybody's doing their own thing and nobody really knows in terms of putting it all together as a, as a system. And, and I think there's great opportunity there for family medicine, family practice, family doctors to take the lead in saying this is the way to go. We, we agree with everyone in, this, in the system, in governments and public voices who are saying people with chronic diseases who can't access the care they need at home, in institutional care, uh, continuing care, acute care. They don't know where to turn. They're not seeing it put together as a system. We could actually be the core of the system that actually makes this work better. And that's part of the challenge for the future for family medicine and for this college. Great. Thank you. So Cal, all the things that we've been talking about um, made me reflect on, on an interesting fact I noticed. And, in looking over the history of the college. And back in the late 60s, early 70s, um, the college membership had begun to decline. But with the rise of certification, there was suddenly a sudden increase in the membership, um, driven perhaps by the introduction of residency training and, and this new uh, uh, recognition of, uh, of competence in the discipline. Um, and then it started to level off again. And Probably beginning in the early 90s, um, began to see an increase, but certainly in the latter half of your term, a huge increase in membership. Um, there's probably a lot of reasons for that, but I wondered if you could comment on your perception of why this second sudden increase has, um, has ha occurred and, and, and how the college contributed to that, perhaps. Well, it is a, it's a really fascinating area and of course it was uh, you know watching our membership numbers has always been a significant thing for us as it would be for any organization uh, we did go through uh, we, we maintained our membership by the way I think throughout our history uh, in terms of our increases were not occurring at the same rate but our attrition rates were never that high we always were within around 1.5 to 2 percent attrition over a given year and we were always concerned even about that but but that was where we remain we maintained ourselves but several things started to happen over the last uh, half a decade or a little bit more uh, one was and we had talked about this a little bit earlier the concern about uh, physician shortages in the country was something we were part of a collaborative advocating for a need for us to produce more physicians in order to take care of our aging and growing population and it took uh, about a half a decade for the message to get through to those in the system who need to support, uh, to f provide the supports for this to happen. But uh, around uh, uh, the year, around somewhere around 2003, 2004, we started to see increases in medical school enrollment. Medical schools, which were putting out about 1,500 graduates a year, got closer to 2,000 than to 2,500. There was also uh, more support for encouraging medical students to be aware of family medicine, primary care, and to uh, be selecting this. There were the efforts within the medical stu uh, student population, uh, which we took a lead role in, but was certainly a role by the medical associations and others, to uh, bring family medicine to their attention. We established medical student interest groups. Our college offered medical student scholarships and leadership awards. We had uh, a, a medical student uh, section that we developed uh, for students across the country who were interested, potentially interested in a career in family medicine. We provided uh, positions on our board uh, for medical students and, and to, to uh, because we felt it was so important for us to have their voice and to also have them feel some ownership and sense of belonging in our organization. 
uh, and, and so medical student numbers and student choices of family medicine increased. Our residency position numbers increased across the country. So distributed learning started for family medicine with, with centers for residency training in many more uh, places and communities than there were before. And as people finished this training, uh, all of them were, became certificates if they succeeded in our certification process and became members of our college ongoing. So there was a definite increase because of the increase in residents that were graduating in family medicine. There was also an increase because there was an influx of foreign or international medical graduates, a significant proportion being family doctors, and we hoped that we could welcome them into our organization, some of them to become eligible for a through a practice route for our certification. We had a route that we opened for experienced family physician family physicians across Canada who were not certificants but had been in practice for over a certain number of years and met other criteria to actually uh, achieve our certification through a time-limited uh, non-exam route that gave us several hundred more members through that. We had conditions improving in the practice environment with better support for family doctors and the word that had been out there that medical students were hearing that if you become a family doctor there's this huge income disparity with other specialists. There still is an income disparity that may be a bit more than it should be but it has narrowed because we're supporting new models of primary care and family practice and graduates the medical students and new graduates are attracted to these and they're selecting family medicine in larger numbers. So all of these things played to our membership numbers increasing. And then of course we started to use your picture more in promoting family medicine. Much. So that <laughs> attracted many more people as well. Thank you, Cal. <laughs> <laughs> so one, and this is just re quite totally random. I, you mentioned uh, the influx of international medical graduates and I'm, and I just uh, wrote a piece that might end up in CFP on women in family medicine. And if there's one category where our memberships change dramatically, it's, it's in the number of women. Um, to the point where the challenge for diversity within the, within the discipline is how do we recruit more men, not more women, and how do we involve more of the um, internationally trained physicians into the organization to advocate for their needs. Do you, have right. you had any thoughts about that? Well, no, and your, yeah. your, your point is very well taken, and, and some of the increases that uh, I alluded to a few moments ago uh, in the number of residents, we do know that the proportion of those that are women uh, is uh, greater, that makes up the greatest proportion of that increase. So yeah. although we're, and we're now back up to 35% of, of graduates, medical school graduates selecting family medicine as their first choice, uh, I think the last I saw the number of women graduates who were selecting family medicine was in the high 40 percents and the men is, were in the low 20s and maybe in some schools below that. Uh, I think the first thing to do is actually not dissimilar to what the college did back when we had a global concern about the decrease in, in, uh, in uh, students selecting family medicine and that is to meet with them. And if we feel we need to meet with male medical students, or maybe there's, I think you can meet with all medical students and discuss this issue and talk about it and find out what it is that, that men who are in, in uh, medical school, what they would find attractive about a career in family medicine and what they don't. And why are they making selections in the other direction? There may have been some studies done on this, but I would focus on them to get the first feedback for this. I think it is something that uh, may have its ups and downs, ebbs and flows that, that it could still, I wouldn't be totally pessimistic about men selecting family medicine uh, in greater numbers again in the future. There are other disciplines that are facing the same thing. There are more women in medicine generally yeah. and there are some of the uh, other specialties, some of the surgical specialties that have a similar if not greater problem in terms of, of uh, who's selecting in terms of men versus men and women, how many in each are selecting their specialties. Uh, so it's something I think we, we need to face as a college and as a discipline of family medicine, but also a bit of it we could, f we could explore collaboratively with other organizations looking at the trends like this. What about other cultural and ethnic groups um, that are, um, I certainly have noticed the change in surnames of people gra achieving certification. Um, they're not all Anglo-Saxon anymore by any means. In fact, that may be a minority. And I'm, but I don't see it reflected so much in the uh, 
in who's involved in college committees and governance and so on. Do you think that's a challenge? Or? Well, it is a challenge. I think the, the college has looked at this, and, and I would expect that uh, Francine Lemire and everybody in the college now <coughs> is going to continue to look at strategies to try and address this. Uh, w one of the, the, I think there's an honest uh, objective within the college to definitely have diversity uh, amongst the leadership and amongst the membership for certain. I think we've got the members but they're not all becoming involved in committees or taking leadership positions and it's going to be multifactorial as to why they don't. Some of them, uh, I guess, you know, it reminds me a bit about again something we talked about earlier in terms of at the start of my time wanting to try to reach out to a much broader scope of family physicians who I knew, I had heard from them personally and we had some studies that told us this, but I knew personally that they had a very distorted image of the college. They saw us as being unapproachable and not having a role for them. And, and so we decided we have to start to try and find ways to reach out to them. And, and part of it again is sitting down with groups like that who, have, who represent a particular community and asking them, Let's, let's hear from them and letting them know personally that we have this opportunity for them and we want to welcome them in. Can they help us do this? Tell us what we have to do, but not just tell us so that we then do something, do it with us. They have to be part of that in terms of reaching out to those who share that community with them and we can all become one, which is really what our goal is. And it can take some time. You have to be patient with a lot of things. You and I have both learned that over our time in the college. We'd like to have seen a lot of things happen a lot faster, but you have to take those baby steps and then you can take a few bigger steps and you may see a little bit of uptake initially uh, and then you can see it grow. It's another one of these things with leadership that I think you have to learn and you have to also, well, you have to be adaptable and you can change some of your strategies based on what you're learning along the way. But if you've made a decision as an organization after appropriate due process with appropriate debate and you decide something, you then have to basically not be thrown off the path by some of the setbacks that occur along the way. Some of the people who didn't favor what you're doing will still oppose it, but they were in the minority and the majority wanted to go another direction. You listen, you can still learn, but you can't be thrown off track and say, well, we're not going to do it because we just heard from 10 people who don't want us to do that. Mm -hmm. So whatever aspect it is, including how you build your leadership team, uh, I think you start with small steps. You take some of the blows of things that you might not do correctly. Uh, definitely reach out to the populations that are the ones that you know you want to reach out to and have them do this with you. Mm -hmm. And I think that down the road, five years later, you'll, you'll reap some of the benefits of this. Good. Great, thank you, excellent.